I would like to introduce two respondents to Lori's presentation and to start up the conversation. Uh, first up is Elizabeth Strom, who is an uh, associate professor in the Department of Geography and the director of the Urban and Regional Planning Department. Elizabeth Strom's past research has as analyzed uh, urban planning decisions in Berlin after Germany's reunification, as well as the economic development challenges facing the industrial cities in the United States. Results of her Berlin research have been published in Building the New Berlin, The Politics of Urban Development in Germany's Capital, published by Lexington Books in 2001. Her current work examines cities, that have developed cultural facilities as part of their downtown revitalization strategies, and she has carried out case studies on downtown redevelopment in a number of the U.S. cities as part of a larger project funded by the Knight Foundation. She is also interested in universities, cultural institutions, and other nonprofits as urban political actors. Dr. Strom holds a BA from Swarthmore College, a Master's of City Planning from Massachusetts Institute of Technology and both an MA and a PhD from the City University of New York. Her work has been published in the Journal of Urban Affairs, Urban Affairs Review, the International Journal of Urban and Regional Research, German Politics and Society, and the Euro European Urban and Regional Research. Please welcome Elizabeth Strom. Um, and urbanism at the USF School of Architecture and Community Design. She holds a Master's of Architecture in Urban Design from the Harvard Graduate School of Design and a Bachelor's of Architecture in Distinction from Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. Um, Bassett has a research interest in cultural and regional landscapes and dynamic topographies and how they interfere with urbanism. Her work intersects with the theoretical exploration of alternative methods and practices in designing and leading the city. Please welcome Shannon. And I found that the major change I noticed is that over time, 
In the 1960s, advocates for the arts talked about the arts as being uh, you know, important for national pride and important for education. And by 1995, every single arts advocate in Congress was saying, we need to support the arts because it's economically important. So there's been a real reframing of what the role of the arts are and arguments for why public policy should support it. Um, and so um, we also see that the role of the arts in uh, public policy and MCs has changed because we see that cities now uh, view the arts as very uh, important and very instrumental. Um, I've studied a number of cities that have done a variety of things to try to incorporate the arts into their urban development programs. We've seen all over that cities build uh, museums and they build performing arts centers. And often they do them not so much because they're trying to make the argument that we uh, need to encourage art for its own sake, but rather they'll do those economic impact analyses and say we need this to compete with other cities, uh, we need this because it will bring X number of dollars into the economy. Um, we also see it, another project I just did was I studied cities that have supported uh, the development of housing specifically for artists. And we uh, surveyed the cities to find out why are you spending tax dollars to build housing for artists then 87% um, of them said that they thought it would have uh, economic value, that artists would bring economic value to their cities. And so whether they were cities that had artists that needed housing, or even more frequently cities that had no artists and wanted to encourage them to move there, they were doing it because they thought artists now um, are seen as no more starving artists, rather artists are catalysts for economic activity. And if we want to be a competitive city and we want to um, show that we're, you know, we're the 21st century economy, then we need to have artists living here. Um, and it works out well in terms of uh, urban planning policies and housing policies because artists are often willing to inhabit uh, places in the city that are, have been rendered obsolete by economic restructuring. And so if you want to attract the typical middle class family, you need to have the typical middle class housing. But you know, artists will move into warehouses and train stations and old bank buildings, and uh, and that's what cities often have to offer. And so you can have encourage artists to move into these spaces that don't have uh, value in any other way. Um, and then they're seen to bring other sorts of economic activity with them. And so cities see this as a real win-win in terms of their economic development strategies. Uh, we also see that many cities and states are paying more attention to what they call the cultural economy or cultural industries. Um, this is the idea, again, that the arts are not just kind of a luxury, it's not just philanthropy, but rather a recognition that uh, the arts are connected to other sorts of profit-making kinds of industries, whether it's graphic arts, advertising, publishing, um, you know, the music business. These are all for-profit businesses that thrive being next to uh, uh, large populations of artists. Um, artists move to cities because they can get jobs doing those other things and then support themselves to do their own art. And so cities are now promoting this uh, sort of cultural economy as an important part of what they do. I know Massachusetts just hired someone to be the state cultural industries director uh, to look for those kinds of linkages. Um, and we also see perhaps somewhat more uh, cynically or disturbingly that, that real estate developers understand that art can be a selling point for what they do. Uh, there's a condominium being developed in St. Pete that actually has the name Art. Um, that's the name of the condominium project. And it, its claim to fame was that they were going to work with a cultural center that was going to show Dale Chaluli glass works. Now, from what I've heard, the art center is actually going ahead, but the condominium isn't because the economy is so bad. But you know, clearly the idea, if you're a condominium development the developer in St. Pete or somewhere else, and how do you distinguish your project from the identical one next door? And the answer is, well, you say we're associated with artists in some way, that really, um, that developers see this as a selling point um, and, and see that the presence of artists sort of adds value to what they're doing. Um, and there's all kinds of, um, of, of things I found when I was looking for examples of artist housing for my research. Uh, of, of now business magazines have articles with names like Bohemian Today, High Rent Tomorrow, uh, or uh, things like, uh, if you're looking for a real estate investment, follow the artist. Uh, and so there's clearly an idea that, um, that artists now uh, really are, uh, are, are gonna take us out of the doldrums that many cities face and then lead us into this new economic promised land. Uh, and we know very well, if any of you ever look at ads, which I did once for things that are advertised as artist lofts, you realize how few of these lofts could actually be a place an artist would be able to afford or be able to work if they're marketed as artist lofts. I found an ad for uh, a loft in, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, which I lived in many years ago. Um, and it says, don't be de deceived by the graffiti doors and the storefronts nearby. 
Once inside, this artist loft will be amazed at the transformation of this former industrial space. And we're going to talk about how it has Australian Jara wood floors and Pietra Colombina limestone fireplaces. I don't even know what they mean, but I can see they're like really high end. Uh, so clearly, this is not a loft that an artist is going to move into and work in, uh, yet they're marketed that way. And so I mention these things because I think it poses some interesting challenges for artists and for people who see art as socially transformative. Um, clearly, there are good trends for artists going on because no longer do you have to make the argument, we are relevant. Um, it's clear that you are relevant. Uh, and so, and it's clear also that it's possible to find arts funding now from places we wouldn't have found it before. Economic development departments, creative industries departments are funding artists in art spaces which they wouldn't have done before. But the question is, how do you ride this tiger without having it eat you up? Um, how do you uh, not simply become an excuse for gentrification uh, or an excuse for, uh, uh, you know, for pursuing policies that are not concerned with working class people in your city? Uh, if we transform warehouses and factories into artist housing, that's a good thing, but are we conceding that we no longer care about working class jobs in our city? And so I think it's interesting to think about the ways that, uh, that, that our economic and political elites want to use the arts in transforming cities and ways that artists uh, see themselves in transforming cities and see whether there's a way to resolve some of these conflicts or at least be cognizant of them as we move ahead. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, uh, I was actually very impressed um, with the, uh, the presentation and then some of the readings I was actually doing that you had had uh, by this notion of um, indeterminacy, uh, open-endedness, and in a way that um, I think your interaction with these, some of these sites became a kind of tool for conversations, whether or not, at, at a lot of different scales as well, a kind of fine-grained scale or a larger scale, if it was you were looking at a really kind of contaminated site, such as, was it the gypsum, the, um, the sites in Florida that you were showing, um, and how you somehow inserted yourself into that and maybe some of the interviews or the mappings even, or, or even the mappings of the, the kind of industrial process from one part of the country you know, to, to Florida. Um, so I, I was impressed by that. Um, a lot of uh, some of my own research uh, looks at uh, this idea of environmental remediation as a kind of catalyst as an economic catalyst, um, as a catalyst for the city. Um, there was a very um, more theoretical project that I was involved with um, that had two parts. Um, it was a, a kind of survey of the city of New Orleans prior to the Hurricane Katrina, uh, really understanding the different kind of um, urban systems and how they interacted with eco ecological systems. Um, and as a kind of follow-up after the hurricane that occurred, um, how can you really begin inserting landscape as urbanism or in kind of in this idea of, of environment or the transformation of the environment as a kind of remediation for the city? I think some of the other issues that you started to touch upon was this issue of kind of land ownership or collective land ownership where maybe I'm inserting this, but um, like land swaps, the idea that, um, uh, again, maybe, you know, this, this kind of indeterminacy that you were talking about that I think the landscape and the environment kind of affords, certainly in, in, as far as urbanism goes, uh, could somehow be kind of combined with this idea of, um, you know, re reorganizing or reallotting this, this concept of, of land ownership for the plot for the collective good, maybe. Um, it was interesting that Liz was starting to talk about or uh, mentioning in her talk this idea of um, uh, post-industrial post -industrial sites as these kind of catalysts for the city. Uh, certainly, I've just returned from two months in Beijing where you see a lot of this idea of, of a creative industry. Um, the 798 district was basically uh, an electronics um, uh, district um, uh, during kind of the Mao period that of course it has been um, was, was catalyzed for the artists kind of moving in there and producing art um, and you know in a sense it's become a kind of transformative engine for the city 
I think, that a lot of other cities um, are beginning to recognize and in fact implement um, policies for this, this kind of improvement of the creative industry because they see them as viable economic engines for the city. Um, some of the projects that I've also looked at in my own research, um, for example, are um, you know, post-industrial landscapes, meaning the idea that they had a kind of former life um, when there was more kind of manufacturing, manufacturing based or in industry uh, within the US or Canada basically, but then the fact these sites have become abandoned with the shifting of industry, whether or not it's you know, to across the border or to, other, or to developing countries. So in fact, these sites often need, you know, often in need of remediation because they're severely environmentally contaminated. Um, are these wastelands often in the center of the city um, in various strategic locations, perhaps? Um, the one that I was looking at was um, in Ottawa, Canada. I mean, but you see examples of this in all North American cities. Um, it was a pulp and paper mill uh, that was located on the Ottawa River, which in fact is, you know, again, some of the most um, amazing um, kind of sites in the city. Um, and it, its kind of logic was because of the kind of industrial logic why it was located there. Uh, to make a long story short, because as I was kind of researching the article that I wrote, I was, the pulp and paper mill um, tried to sue me <laughs> because I was exposing a kind of lot of existing contamination of the site. Um, but I think that there's a real opportunity for these, these abandoned sites um, to become viable economic engines for the city. But again, how do you deal with um, the kind of severe degradation and environmental contamination? Well, I think that again, uh, you know, looking at this idea of, of landscape as urbanism, because it has, again, some of the issues uh, that Laura was beginning to identify it has this notion of indeterminacy, a kind of open-ended framework, I think, that a lot of, you know, quote, more architectural urban design doesn't have. Um, it also, I think, affords a, an ability to kind of have this collective participatory process, which I was also very impressed with Lori's work, the idea that these um, site insertions or, you know, whether or not it's at the, the, the scale of the, the oxygen, the oxygen, the oxygen bars that are actually making a tour around the city as a kind of conversation piece, or um, you know, if it's if it's the actual contaminated site itself, um, you know, are somehow kind of engaged in this collective dialogue that you know might might be transformative. Um, I'm working on a project right now with my students that is on the Tampa waterfront, which again, I think we can look at and say is, you know, for whatever reason, has not really fully realized its potential as a post-industrial landscape. And in fact, it exists very much as an industrial landscape right now. You can, I'd explain to my students, you can say that in the way in which the architecture engages or turns its back to the river. You know, some precedents, we, we were looking at the San Antonio, basically the, the river acted as a kind of sewage <laughs> for the city until they realized the huge potential of that kind of landscape or natural resource as an economic engine for the city. And then subsequently it, its urbanism started you know, fronting or, or recognizing that kind of edge. And I think that there's a real opportunity with Tampa and its proposed river walk that has, you know, somehow kind of begun to insert itself in Tampa. Um, a real opportunity, again, I think, to activate some of those um, water edges into economic engines for the city. But likewise, I think, um, you know, maybe some more marginalized communities also have their houses along there. So I think with some of those public spaces, it could also present a possibility to have more kind of, you know, kind of collective engagement around this process of transformation. Um, you know, we're in fact going, I'm going later tonight up to Toronto, Ontario, that has done, that city has in fact been very successful um, in taking some of these kind of abandoned industrial sites, again, retooling them into economic engines, um, but has also kind of very actively um, introduced landscape um, in that they've returned the natural edge uh, to the city. In fact, that you have amazing kind of natural ecologies in the center of a very kind of urban city. Um, and again, there's a lot of kind of public activation or kind of public spaces around those. 
Uh, so I guess my question to Lori might be, um, how could you engage, I mean, some of the, the, the absolute degra degraded sites that you showed us today, um, how could you begin to engage those as, um, I mean, how would you begin to remediate that maybe through your methodology your, or your process of working? Yeah, it's, it's a really great question. Can you hear me? I don't know if this is working. Yeah. Closer, okay. Um, as you were, it, thank you both. It's really great to hear mm -hmm. what you're doing. Um, well, one example, which wouldn't be th my methodology, but I think it, it relates to what you're saying. Um, one of the sites I visited, maybe many of you have been there, to the, the Bingham Pit outside of Salt Lake City, which is a big copper, like the biggest man-made excavation in the world, and that's what one of those mounds was. But um, the, the company that owns um, that has become Rio Tinto, which is one of the biggest worldwide you know, miners, mining companies. All of, and, um, they have been successfully avoiding, they had been successfully avoiding any environmental remediation of the site for decades because they basically own Utah. I mean, they, you know, provide more than half of the economic activity. And so, but then suddenly, um, and then the EPA finally got involved, the federal EPA, because it was just the, the state for a while, and the federal EPA said we're going to um, slap a super, super fund um, tag on, and, and um, Kennecott Rio Tinto said, um, oh no, don't do that, let's have a memorandum of understanding, which is this thing <laughs> called a moot, which is also something that you do with your mouth in French, it's mm -hmm. kind of like, ooh, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and anyway, so they, they came up with a memorandum of understanding, which in a way, well, did actually make Kennecott Rio Tinto solely voluntarily responsible for remediation, which meant that nothing really happened for a while. And then suddenly, it happened. Suddenly, they they did dramatic remediation, and they um they 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 were the you know backhoe got all the stuff, they moved it, they they did you know more than 100 percent. They started to clean the biggest groundwater problem, one of the ones in the, in the country. And the reason is is that the copper's running out. And so they realized that they have something like 92,000 acres that's going to be really crappy land that they own. Mm -hmm. But they could to make this. And so they started doing this. And at the same time, they mm -hmm. formed a development, real estate development corporation underneath them, mm -hmm. which has created the city called Gabriel, mm -hmm. which is you probably more about it than I do. I, um, I think the site was the subject of a ULI Urban Land Institute competition a few years ago. And it's interesting because I think one of the winning schemes or um, honorable mentions said, we're going to do a land swap because we don't think that you should develop on that land <laughs> because of the kind of intensive um, kind of remediation necessary for it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's one of these things where, you know, there's a lot of contradictions mm -hmm. going on. And one level, it's like, Thank you very much. 
much. I'm, I'm thinking of a presentation I saw um, uh, from, it's actually an architect urbanist, but um, a strategy uh, just north of Boston. It's, it's um, I'm forgetting the name of the, the town, but there's a kind of salt works um, because of course, um, they would uh, reorient the salt. They didn't bring it into the Boston kind of port, but they kind of done, I think it's Chelsea actually. Um, so he was working with the city of Chelsea and this kind of retooling economic engine that the actual uh, salt work pile became this um, uh, surface for projections, which you know actually <laughs> coincided with um, different events that that kind of city was celebrating. But it it sounds like again a lot of your research is much more about maybe a transformative nature, as as you're saying. Um, it's transformative, but that this is this thing of like, mm -hmm. you know, this potential sort of hovering out there, but um, it's kind of like we have to pick and pull it out, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I think this is a very, pr for me, it's a very preliminary stage without any, you know, you could, yeah, yeah. You could say it's a very passive project, and sometimes, again, I look at, you know, some of the artists I admire most and the works I admire most, and I think, oh, they're really asserting a position on the world, but I feel so fundamentally disaffected <laughs> <laughs> with the way things are that that the best I can do is try to just look at it and mm -hmm. and and kind of por make a portrait right now I think um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Back to the okay. Discussion.